Thank you, David. If the world is flat, as oh no, if uh, uh, Joanna said that uh, uh, there's a level playing field, why does she get 20 minutes and I only get 10? No answer. So, um, so it's nice to come after these three people, one of whom is telling us that technology is finally catching up with human behavior, although I don't know what she knows about human behavior. Uh, the second person who's developing technology for facial recognition, and this other person who seems to spend her life listening in and turning it into a profession, calling herself a social scientist, whatever that means. So I'm here to tell you something else. And I was saying to David, um, events are made by their location. Uh, in, the, uh, in Silicon Valley, they'll always tell you that it's made by the participants. That's garbage. It's made by where they're held. And this is a perfect location to talk about the social future. It's a perfect location to imagine that future. Because, of course, it's a place that has been reinvented brilliantly, innovatively. It's a place of one kind of network, a 19th century network that's been reinvented or is being reinvented as a 21st century network, perhaps not a digital network, but something to go alongside digital networks. Whereas in the 19th century, uh, St. Pancras that uh, was first built in 1862, right at the heart or the height of the 19th century industrial revolution, uh, was uh, built in order to facilitate that physical network of the railway, which was the core network in the analog industrial revolution. Uh, now, uh, William Gibson said, famously, or perhaps not so famously, the future is the past, only better. And I would add that the future is the past, only better, or worse. Because what we're seeing now, what these people were talking about, is the reappearance of the social. Joanna is confident, uh, as so many of this Facebook social crowd, that they're first to this social future. But the social future has happened before. We have experience of that social future, and unlike social scientists who aren't interested in learning from history, or entrepreneurs who don't know any history, that's perhaps why they're good entrepreneurs, um, we need to learn a little bit about history if we're to understand how that social future can be more successful than the previous one. We're living at a time of great fundamental change, equivalent in the middle to the middle of the 19th century. You remember Justin Timberlake, otherwise known as uh, Sean Parker in the social network? He was snorting so some cocaine from a, a young woman's chest and also selling the idea of connectivity and transparency at the same time. And he said very famously, Aaron Sorkin's words, we lived on farms, then we lived in cities, and now we're going to live on the internet. And unlike so much entrepreneurial hype, that's true. We are shifting from an analog industrial network, the great industrial age, to a knowledge economy which is defined by its digital network. So when we say we live on the internet, of course we live in real life, but the virtual is real now. There is no distinction, there's no coincidence that second life is in the fucked company neighborhood of, uh, of TechCrunch or all these other sites. The virtual has gone away, or the virtual is real. So what we're living through then is a profound shift, a profound revolution in the way we organize ourselves. And that's why the people who come before me are utopians for their own reasons, generally material but also idealistic. They believe that this new network, this new social infrastructure can save humanity. I'm not so sure. There are two possible social futures, and you can find them one mile that way and one mile that way. Most of you are Londoners. I grew up here. I live in Silicon Valley now, but one mile that way in University College, about a mile down the road, you can get the bus there, you'll find the auto icon of Jeremy Bentham, the founder of utilitarianism. He was the guy who also, like Joanna, believed that technology is finally catching up with human behavior. You can go and look at him now. He's a, he exists forever. He stuffed himself and left himself to, uh, to, to the human race because he believed he was very wise. 
One wonders whether Mark Zuckerberg will do the same thing eventually. <laughs> maybe he'll leave himself, I'm not sure. Maybe, I don't know if, he'd, if he left himself to Harvard, I don't know if he took it because uh, he didn't get a degree there. Anyway, uh, you go to, uh, and, and, and Bentham was of course the inventor of what's known as the inspection house or uh, the panopticon. Bentham believed that it was in our interest to be watched. Bentham believed that um, we can be made more efficient and happier by being watched. That's why he invented his panopticon. It wasn't just a prison. He believed that this principle could work for healthcare, for schools, for all forms of social organization. In this new analog network, Bentham believed, we were best suited to be watched through his physical network. He wanted us to be visible. He wanted to eliminate loneliness. So that's one option we have in the digital age. Of course, it's laid out by our three previous speakers. Here's my other option, the second alternative, which one I strongly suggest we take. We go that way, up the Pentonville Road. I know there are some Arsenal supporters in the audience. Unfortunately, sometimes we do have to go that way. Um, John Stuart Mill was born in Pentonville. Uh, and he wrote a brilliant book called On Liberty in 1859. Mill was originally a utilitarian, a follower of Bentham. He believed, ultimately, that Bentham was fundamentally flawed in his analysis. I write about this in some detail in my book. But basically, Bentham, uh, sorry, basically, Mill was trying to protect individual autonomy, liberty, privacy, secrecy in the new age of the industrial network. So when you read a book like On Liberty, it was a protection of individual liberty in the face of this cult of the social, or at least the cult of the analog social that was perpetrated by Bentham and many indu other industrialists in the 19th century. Zuckerberg isn't original in his cult of the social, but of course, in a sense, Joanna's right. He has technology on his side. Joanna referred to Zuckerberg's law. She called it Moore's law, but it's Zuckerberg's law. The idea that information about us will double every year. We are, of course, falling into the trap, the great seduction of using this new network to promote ourselves on Facebook, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on every social network, from image social to social living, there are hundreds of companies being founded with the name social. Everything is going public. Every or almost every new company coming out of Silicon Valley and London now is social. We are being seduced into going onto this digital network, this new world that, um, that Parker talks about, to reveal ourselves. It's supposed to be in our interest. We are promoting ourselves so that social scientists, and the guys at Facebook and all the other startups can benefit from our data. We are essentially becoming data in the 21st century, but we're not really profiting from it. That's my little reference to Vertigo. My book deals quite heavily with Vertigo, but that's Jimmy Stewart, of course. And he was seduced by a woman, a blonde, who actually was a brunette. Uh, and that, of course, is the rather facile, vulgar, uh, metaphor that I'm introducing here. We seem to be seeing the blonde, and there was even a blonde here just earlier, um, but what we're really seeing is the brunette. What we're really seeing is a kind of fake, a seduction that will destroy us rather than make us. I went up the Acropolis a few weeks ago after David and I go to the WPP stream event, and all I found at the top were people photographing each other. That's a wonderful example of what I call digital narcissism. Social media is digital narcissism. We've invented this technology. Joanna says technology is finally catching up with human behavior. I'm not so sure if that's true. Technology is changing human behavior. Technology is changing it in a way in which we are using it to promote ourselves, from our photographs to our taste, to what we're playing on Spotify or SoundCloud. Why are we giving away so much of our information, so much of our intimate information, our reading habits, our television habits, our listening habits, our political views? 
so that Noreen can listen in and quantify it, so that Facebook can be valued at $80 billion, even though they're not paying us for our information. Something has gone fundamentally wrong. I'm not very good with this thing. I don't usually quote Frenchmen, but anyway, there was one Frenchman called Michel Foucault who once said something of some intelligence. He said, visibility is a trap. And he's absolutely right. Foucault was the great critic of Bentham of the 20th century. And Foucault unfortunately died 20 years ago. We need him back because we need to be reminded of the dangers of visibility. We need to understand that visibility is a thing that will destroy us. Visibility is undermining individual nature. I think I've overstayed my one final thing. Eliminating loneliness. Even Sean Parker has come up with a term with his new startup, Airtime. We shouldn't want to eliminate loneliness. We need to remind ourselves of who we really are. Technology is not finally catching up with human behavior. Human behavior is something essential, and we can't be corrupted by the kind of narcissism and stupidity that social media is promoting. Thank you.